and sisters, let us pray. A holy God, we gather in humility and awe this day to give you thanks and offer our praise for your many mercies and your goodness. As we pray and sing, as we listen for your word and share in this time of fellowship, may we worship you in spirit and in truth, the sovereign ruler of all things. Amen. And so friends, using the response of call to worship, God established the world from of old. God delivered us in freedom and truth. Amen. And so let us stand as we sing together at number 21. We'll sing stanzas 1 and 3 if you're turning to the hymnal or the, the words, the stanzas are in the uh, bulletin as well. In number 21, this is My Father's World, stanzas 1 and 3.
eternal God of these sighs and hopes and longings, we lift up to you with Jesus, who taught us all to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now this, the scripture lesson for this day in the church here, for Christ the King Sunday, it's one of the readings. It's a, the, the New Testament epistle lesson. It's Revelation chapter 1, verse 4b, the second half of verse 4, and running on through verse 8. So listen for what the Spirit might say to you from Revelation chapter 1. Listen for God's Word. Grace to you and peace from Him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before His throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Friends, thus far a reading of God's Holy Word.
scandals of various sorts. We probably, most of us recall the, the dramas turned out involving Princess Diana and now King Charles back in the 80s and 90s up until Princess Diana's untimely death in 1997. Their relational drama played out in tabloid and mainstream media and many, many people found the personal and, and sometimes maybe salacious details of the royal marriage and its dissolution compelling, perhaps because the situation highlighted the very human nature even of royalty. The royal scandals can be barely benign, Princess Marie and Prince Joachim say they are <coughs> exiled from Denmark after falling out with the prince's elder brother. Uh, Princess Sal, the wife of King Mohammed VI of Morocco, several years ago disappeared from public view amid whispers of the conservative nation of their discreet divorce. During COVID uh, travel restrictions, the Netherlands King Willem Alexander and Queen Maxima were criticized for using a government jet to travel to a, a Greek vacation spot. At the same time, the citizens of the Netherlands were far more restricted in where they could travel. Now, on the other hand, dust-ups about royal behavior can involve more, more weighty or significant matters. Back in 2018, Saudi Arabian Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman was accused by U.S. intelligence officials of having a Saudi journalist a murderer who had been critical of the, the Saudi royal family. And as you might remember from history classes, <coughs> the the history of royals is, can be, uh, was a bit darker than the, the illustrations here. Kings and queens through much of human history asserted their rights and their prerogatives, often at the expense of the, the people that they rule. And so in a free republic in which we elect our representatives, we 21st century Americans are, are far removed maybe from really understanding the power uh, of kings and centuries gone by. Kings were rulers who had and who exercised a genuine power. Kings really affected the daily lives of their subjects and shaped, in some instances, the destiny of nations. Kings sent, kings sent armies into the field to advance their claims and to defend their interests and honor and to repel enemies and to extend the borders of their kingdoms. Kings could be more interested in personal power or securing private advantage for themselves than the welfare of the people they rule. In spite of that, the New Testament picks up on the imagery of kingship to describe Jesus. And when it, when it does, however, it is apparent that Jesus is a different kind, a different sort of king. And yet even Jesus is still scandalous in his own blood. And so over against, to so make the argument, over against the, the counterclaims of other religious perspectives, the New Testament presents Jesus as more than a mere man. He is, in the New Testament, deity. He is God. He is the Son of God made flesh. So from that identity as the God-man flow the offices and the work of Jesus in his role as the mediator between God and human beings. So now the scriptures use king language to describe God and his relationship to creation. Psalm 19 explains, The Lord has established His throne in the heavens, and His kingdom rules over all. And then the deity of Jesus, as I say, is affirmed throughout the scriptures. Titus 2.13 tells us that we are waiting on the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That affirmation finds that Jesus is God and shares in God's kingship. That the affirmation that Jesus is deity finds extra biblical attestation and other sources as well. An interesting one was a mosaic discovered under an Israeli prison in 2005 in Megiddo. The mosaic that they discovered was decorated, decorated a Christian worship space from around the year 230. And so this is before the Nicene Creed, before some of the disputations in the church that hammered out the just the precise language that we use now about the Trinity. In 230 AD, this, this mosaic seems to have referenced a communion table, sort of a, a, a brass plaque of its day. And the mosaic has an inscription that reads, The God-loving Akeptus has offered the table to God, Jesus Christ, as a memorial. 
And that mosaic will be on display in Washington, D.C., a museum in 2025. But in any instance, Jesus says, God made flesh can rightly be called king. And we might ask them, where is, is this kingdom of the God man? Where is the kingdom of Jesus Christ? Jesus defined his kingdom in John 18, 36, when he was speaking with Pilate, when he was being interrogated. Jesus answered Pilate and said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting, but my kingdom is not of this world. Jesus didn't deny he was a king, but he denied that his kingdom was like the kingdoms of this world. He was a different kind of king. Jesus is king of a kingdom, not of an external political kingdom, but a kingdom whose territory and domain are discovered in the hearts of God's people. In Luke 17, 21, we have a record of Jesus saying, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there, about the kingdom of God. For behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. The kingdom Jesus describes can be entered into by faith. In John 3, 3, Jesus tells us, no one enters the kingdom of God unless they are born again. It is a spiritual kingdom entered by faith. In Ephesians 1, 23, Jesus tells us, uh, Paul tells us that Jesus is the head of his body, the church. And this church, as Paul describes it, and his epistles is made not of brick and of mortar, but of men and women. The church is you and me. Jesus rules and reigns in the hearts and souls of those who have been called into the love and forgiveness and to the mercy and grace of God the Father. And so the kingdom of Jesus is more than a kind of fantasy football or a plain make-believe. It is to have a, a real impact in history as it's lived out in our lives. Jesus, as, as God, is, is king forever, but in his role as the Messiah, as mediator, Jesus will one day hand over the kingdom to the Father when grace and good triumph over sin and evil in human history. The kingdom of Jesus has a purpose and a goal in, in time. The Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, then comes the end when he, Jesus, delivers the kingdom of, to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and every power. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. And so all of this is to say that, again, Jesus is a different sort of king and royal in his own sort of royal scandal. The scandal is that Jesus is the king who, for love, gave his life for his people, for the sake of the world. John 10, 17, and 18 has Jesus say, I lay down my life that I might take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down in my own court. The aim of King Jesus is not power or domination for himself, but the salvation of every soul. The kingdom of Jesus is established by, by faith, and is evidenced by peace, and is expanded by forgiveness. Its sign is the cross on which the king was crucified. Its charter is an empty tomb. And the kingdom's goal is the salvation and the transformation and the redemption of you and of me. And so as we conclude the church year with Christ the King Sunday and begin next Sunday a new church year on the first Sunday of Advent, may we turn to acknowledge our great prophet, priest, and king, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is the king of love and grace, and who calls you and who calls me to enter into his kingdom this day.